I'm Maria Menunos, and you're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Hey guys, I'm Princess here with AfterBuzz TV. Tonight we're getting to spotlight on. Tonight we're shining a spotlight on actor Eddie Martinez. You guys may have seen him on USA's The Sinner, the most recent season. Eddie, how are you? Good. How are you, Princess? Nice to meet you. Good. Thank you for having me. Of course. Welcome to the studio. We got a chance to hang out a little bit. Tonight we're going to talk about Eddie's experience on The Sinner, as well as his experience working with Nicolas Cage, as well as his history and just how he got to USA. All right, Eddie, so let's go ahead and get into what we're all here to talk about tonight. So USA, the most recent season of The Sinner, just premiered. How was that experience for you? Tell us about the premiere party. Uh, it was so much fun. It was, uh, aside from having kids, and <laughs> I was going to say one of the best, <laughs> but it was a really fun night. Uh, uh, I was excited to see the episodes. The episode, um, I didn't I didn't watch it so because I, I wanted to wait to, to the premiere to watch it, and mm -hmm. I was looking forward to how everything was put together, and it was better than what I even imagined, so mm -hmm. I was happy about that. I got to meet a whole bunch of people. Got to meet Justin Timberlake, who was really nice. My wife uh, was a big fan of NSYNC, so she got to meet him, and that was like yeah. a dream come true for her. Oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah, and uh, and it was just a fun night. It was a fun night uh, having getting to hang out with everyone from the cast that mm -hmm. we hadn't seen each other for a while, and nice. and celebrate celebrate the work that we all put together. Was that surreal for you? Especially meeting Justin Timberlake, because it would be surreal for me. <laughs> <laughs> what was that experience like for you? How did you feel? Yeah, I, I think surreal is a good word. It was. I was a big fan of the show before I got the offer. So, mm -hmm. And it's not very often business that you get to work on on, on projects that, that that you really, really are a fan of. Or, mm -hmm. and, and so to, being, to, to be able to work with uh, in a project like this and then to find out the cast that you're going to be working with, you're right. I mean, and then while I'm, while I'm working, right, I read all the scripts and the writing is so good. And then mm -hmm. everyone on set is so nice, including the, the executive producer, the showrunners. They're all very nice and welcoming and kind. That's so cool. real is a perfect word of uh, word for it because I was I was in heaven for like four or five months in New York. <laughs> That's really cool. So you we were saying off camera. So you shot in New York and it wasn't upstate. It was just outside the city. Yeah, it was uh the well the stages are in uh, in Brooklyn, New York, okay. and then some of the like the outside stuff, the exteriors were shot in 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 the outskirts of New York City. It wasn't all the way up upstate New York, but outskirts of New York City. Okay, cool. So tell us about Vic Soto and why you were attracted to him. You you talked about you love the writing and you've seen previous seasons. What do you love about this particular character? Okay, well, Vic Soto is a uh, former Marine, recovering alcoholic, and you know, rising star in the Dorchester Police Department that gets to work mm -hmm. alongside Detective Ambrose. Um, I usually play uh, antagonists, like usually play the bad guys in a lot of indie films. And I think uh, this guy, Vic Soto, is the closest to how I am in real life. I, w I was in the Marines Reserves, although I'm oh. not an alcoholic. I don't have, uh, that's the only part that's different. Um, Good for you. But, uh, uh, but I was raised Catholic, how he, he was written as a, as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I was raised Catholic. Uh, I, I have a wife and a family like he does. And, uh, and I'm ambitious like Vic is, trying to move up. And just like Vic is trying to learn from uh, Detective Ambrose, that's Bill Pullman's character, and mm -hmm. trying to get to work with him and get close to him. In real life, I was trying to learn. I was trying to learn everything I could about Bill Pullman and how he works, and trying to get close to him. So uh, it was par like uh, art imitating life. It was parallel lives, and uh, I think he's the closest character to how I am in real life. That's cool. So tell us about working with Bill, and tell us about that experience. Bill is a really nice dude, really nice guy, uh, and he didn't really have to be. He's the star of the show, and mm -hmm. not only is he like, does he sit there and talk to you, not just small talk, but like really engage you in conversation, mm -hmm. and then he goes off and he does his wonderful work scene, and comes back, and it's friendly and nice as ever. Not only just to to me, but like to someone who was just there for one day. Mm -hmm. He's really engaging with people. Um, and he's just, uh, he's got such a great body of work that I was, it was just, uh, I, I learned a lot from, from not only from how he behaved on set, you know, as a, 
as the star of the show, but just mm-hmm. him and doing his work, seeing him how he works. Him and uh, I, I watched a lot of how him and Matt Bomer worked. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just an open, you know, trying to trying to learn as mm-hmm. much as I could from from everybody, so, especially from him. Yeah. So what was, if you could say these are the two biggest things that I learned shooting with them or shooting this season, what would you say? Like, how did you grow? I think uh, being okay with finding finding the scene or, or, or being okay with not finding the moment and just letting it come out orga- organically during rehearsals. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm a former Marine, or, or I, I, I like preparing a lot. I like over-preparing. And then when you get on set, you let it go. And if you did your homework right, it shows up. Um, the way they did it in the center is uh, you, you... Or the way that Bill would do it is uh, you have rehearsals, right? And then I'm used to during rehearsals, you kind of throw it away and you wait till uh, the camera's on to really, uh, but not him. During rehearsals, we were, you, it's almost like doing theater. We were mm-hmm. like working out the scenes to, to see what works. And I was a little not used to doing that, especially because there was mm-hmm. everybody on set is watching you. And, and, you're, and I was used to like, well, I'm only going to, when there's so many people watching you, I'm going to do it when... When it's good, when I know it's gonna be good, not yeah. I don't want people seeing me trying to work and find it and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things that I learned: just let go of the, of the people on set that are watching you, mm-hmm. and uh, and just try to work out the mistakes, the kinks, whatever doesn't work in front of everybody. It doesn't matter. It's just everybody's here for work, and 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 I was taking the lead from from Bill. That's really cool. So you mentioned you were a Marine. My dad was a Marine. I'm very familiar. Oh, well, with tell him thank him for his service. I, I do every ch- every chance I get, um, and so of course being in the military you learn like you said how to prepare, and I just believe in general in life everything that we do prepares us for something later on. So how did you how were you able to pull from those experiences and how has being a Marine prepared you for acting in a way? Mm, that's interesting. Uh, I think in so many ways, so many things. I mean, not only is it about discipline and persistence, uh, but patience. Um, I think the, the the one one of the biggest lessons that I learned in 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 the Marines was um, controlling your emotions. <laughs> yes, you guys that well. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I think as an actor, that's uh, one of the qualities that helps me out because whatever emotions are zimmering on the under there, once once you're uh, I'm in a scene, I could just let go. Mm-hmm. And uh, but if I wasn't aware of all the emotions that I'm trying to keep under control there I wouldn't know what to let go of if that makes any sense Mm, so take us through that process because I feel like learning how to control your emotions is just a life skill in general so if you were to give a crash course on controlling one's emotions where would you start how can we practice this at home well, I mean, I, I do it is I don't, I, and this is what I tell my kids is try not to take everything so personal. Mm. Even when even when someone is trying to put you down, there's so many stuff that they're dealing with that some, I think 90% of the times they're just projecting their own feelings towards you. Mm. So if you're able to keep that in mind, especially when you're in conflict, which is hard to do, it, not that it's easier, but it gets, uh, it's a little bit easier to be able to not, uh, react with anger or, or or with whatever natural emotion you would have it's easier when you say this has nothing to do about me it's what's going on in that person's head mm-hmm. and so that's how i'm able to at least zimmer down my, my my emotions so i don't know how everybody is but my wife says and i think she's right that there's no middle ground for me i go from zero to 60 f- for everything when i get mad i get really mad mm-hmm. and when i'm happy i'm really really ha- annoyingly happy it, mm-hmm. my uh my little niece hates me because when I'm happy, that means that I'm that I'm being extra annoying with her and pulling <laughs> pranks on her and and not. Um, so that's just me. That it's like I can feel like I'm chill out here, but I know under there, I, it's mm-hmm. like I, I I go to 100 in like in, in two seconds. I feel like my uncle is very similar to you. But go <laughs> ahead, go ahead. And I'm that yes, I'm that niece. But go ahead, you were gonna say something. But when I do that, when I keep in mind not to take take things so personally, mm. all that zimmering, that all that that bubbling emotions that are in there, I'm able to able to manage that a little bit better if it makes any any more sense. Any. I gotta practice this. This <laughs> this sounds very helpful and like I said, a life skill. We could all benefit from this. I'm totally being serious. Like, I mean, obviously it helps you as an actor, but 
like I said, I think that's a life skill. How much better would life be if we didn't take things so personally, you know? I think so. And then I think also on, on, your, on your question, uh, uh, on preparing, preparing. I, I, I think sometimes I even over-prepare, but I think I learned that all from, and from, from, from boot camp and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and from being in the Marines, of being having everything organized and, and having everything ready the night before for the next day and, and looking at your plans for the, it's, and that's basically the, 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 the work ethic that I take into, into acting. I like to really prepare to be able to let go the day off. That's cool. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and just go back to something you said earlier. So this is a little bit of a different role for you. You are playing a good guy. Why does that, why does that matter to you? There are some people it doesn't matter as long as they are acting or doing work. What was, what's significant about that to you? Well, I don't think I'm any different from those people that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think I'm at a point in my career where it really doesn't matter to me who I play, mm -hmm. but what, like what kind of stories I'm, I'm, I'm being involved, like with the, the projects is what interests me more. Like if mm -hmm. it's a good project with, with a good creative people, a good writer, a good directors, then it's usually a good sign that whatever role you're in, it's going to be well written. It's mm -hmm. The characters going to be flushed out and it's going to be fun. It's going it, to, it's not going to be hard work. It's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I liked about, what I liked about not playing the bad guy like you say, or that mm -hmm. this role is is different, is because I, I feel like after a while you do get typecast in a certain kind of roles. Like people mm -hmm. only think you can do what they've seen you do before. Right. And I feel like I've I've done those type of characters uh, quite a few times, and and you just after a while you just want to try something different, you mm -hmm. know, like some something something new. That's fair. Now, being a person of color, and I'm also a person of color, if you're listening and you can't see me. Beautiful color, too. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's So that's, that's, that's something I think about is representation and portrayal. You being an actor, do you feel like those, those that weight is on your shoulders? Like, I have to be mindful of how our community is being portrayed? Or does that weigh on your experiences at all? I think now, yeah. Now as I'm getting older, I, I, I keep... I keep that in mind more than than, than before. Mm -hmm. I think before I, you just when you start out, you just I just whatever I can be on, I just want to be in. I just want to get a job. Mm -hmm. But I, that's fair. But after a while, when you start getting the same type of roles, typecast and everything, and you start seeing the same stories, uh, I mean, I don't have to. You, you see the same stories yes. over and over and over again. He's kind of like okay, but you know. We're, we're, we're more than just that. There's something else. You know, like, I love stories, immigrant stories, where I get to play, uh, you know, a day laborer that just got here. And, and I've been in some some projects that are really well written, mm -hmm. were really well written. That was actually in a short film that won uh, the gold at the Student Academy Awards, and it was about day laborers, and it was a really good story. Mm -hmm. But after a while, you do three or four or five little things and not so well written or, or told... It's kind of like, well, we're more than just day laborers. Like, there's people like me that are doctors, mm -hmm. uh, lawyers that that look like me, that are doctors, that are lawyers, that are flawed human beings. But mm -hmm. yeah, you know, that are. Um, I'm just saying, there's yeah. a, we come in all size, shapes, and colors, and there's an array of personalities for people of color. But mm -hmm. it seems like um, in this business, the way it is now, you people of color are, are sort of typecast in a certain role or in certain portrayal of things. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that we are starting to see that shift. Yeah, I think so too. I think finally, yes, this diversity thing that everyone gets tired of, but I think it's finally hitting a mark. Mm -hmm. I think it also helped with the, the Me Too movement. I Definitely. think finally uh, women and uh, marginalized communities are saying uh, we've had enough yeah. <laughs> it's time for us to be seen as a matter of fact when i when i when uh, one of the running jokes that i keep saying the first thing i told the executive producer uh, derek derek simons when i when i sat in his office that i was like i was just happy that i'm not playing a drug deal and i get to speak english <laughs> it's a shame you have to say that but it's very it's very real it's a, it's a thing so for you speaking of roles what is your dream role? What is something that if someone were to say, I'm going to write a role for you, who or what would you love to portray? I love flawed characters. I like leading characters, but that are flawed mm -hmm. because I think that's how real human beings are. We, no, one, no, one, no one is 
really good or really bad. And even bad guys, I don't think, in their mind, they don't think they're bad. Yeah. Uh, but even heroes have flaws. They, have, uh, they make mistakes. They make bad choices. Sometimes mm -hmm. they screw people over. And sometimes sure. they feel bad about it. Sometimes they don't. Um, and I mean, I don't have a specific dream project, except mm -hmm. maybe like this projects that I've been working on. I've been, I'm trying to write and produce, and I've been working on a, on a project for a few years that I'm developing. That's good. And so that would be a dream project, but more of, of a specific project is just that, like a, 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 the dream role would be a, someone who's a really complex, flawed character mm -hmm. that at the end that you go in for the ride and at the end comes out different. And you learn something from that. That's really cool. I love that. I'm not an actor, but I just love to hear what people's dream roles would be. I feel like it speaks to that person and just what's important to them and what they would love to portray. So that's really cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if I, I, I... Right now, I think more like there's dream mm -hmm. uh, people I would like to work with. Like, there's so many... Mm. Like, we'll, we'll be here for hours if you ask me, like, who are the directors that you want to work with, like... Every year, I find like three or four new directors, and I'm like, "Ooh, I want to work with that person." Mm -hmm. Like this year, I saw this um, this movie called Monos, which is an independent film from Colombia, which is mm -hmm. where I'm from, by this great director, Alejandro Landon, I think is, is his name. Okay. And I, after I watched that movie, I texted my manager right away. It's like, "Look at this guy's name. Look at this movie. If there's anything with that guy, I want to be in his next movie." Like that's how good. That's how impressed I was by, by, by that film. What is it called again? Monos. Monos. M-O-N-O-S. Okay, I'm have to look it up. Yeah, it's like it's like uh it's like a gorilla story. It's like Lord of the Lord of the Flies set mm -hmm. in Colombia, in the jungles of Colombia. Oh, that <laughs> seems interesting. I'm have to look that up. Um, one person that you did work with and I wanted to highlight because I feel like he's almost every person's dream person to work with is Nicolas Cage. <laughs> you knew I was gonna bring it up. Can you tell us about that experience and what it was like working with him? It was a great experience, although I hate to disappoint you. I never even met Nicolas Cage. No? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> by the time I got down there, he was... Uh, he was we shot in Colombia, so yeah. by the time I got to, to... When I had to work, he was already done. He was on his way back. Dang. But from everybody on set, I heard he was the nicest guy. He was very professional. Mm -hmm. That all he liked to drink was Red Bull. He drank like 20 Red Bulls a, a day or something like that. I had a boss he, like that. <laughs> but he was very professional and, 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 and very nice. But that film, though, mm -hmm. that film was a, another great project to work with. The director was another really. I, when I read that script, I was mm -hmm. I I really liked that script, and I really enjoyed working with him. And then I got to work with Ryan Quantin. I don't know if he, I don't know if he, he's a, he used to be in True Blood. Okay. I think he was the the brother or the the guy at the at the bar that he owned the bar. Whatever, okay. really good looking uh, blonde dude from Australia. Fair enough. And a really good actor. Uh, and uh, I also got to work with, uh, I call him Rico, Enrico, Enrico Colantini. He's been a whole bunch of stuff, but uh, those are the two main dudes that I, that I, that I ended up hanging out with and, and that I got to work with. And it was shot in Bogota, Colombia, which is the place that I was born. Mm -hmm. I got to hang out with my tias and my cousins. and, That's and sweet. So it was another, another fun project. And, and although in that project I was playing uh, technically a bad guy again, mm -hmm. it was well written that it was fun and it was, it was a different story. It, it, the movie is like about a, a... It follows one person. You think the movie is about this person. And then something happens and you end up following the next person. You, mm, that's why it's okay. called Kill Train. So, it's, so you follow until you get to Nicolas Cage. And that's cool. So let's go ahead. And so you bought up Columbia. Let's go ahead and get into your history and just learn about who you were as a youngin and how you got to where you are today. So I was a troublemaker. Though. You were a troublemaker. Yeah. So... You came over from Colombia at nine years old? How yes. Old? Okay. Yes, I what was, was about that? nine years old, yeah. What was that transition like for you going from Colombia to New York? Uh, I think I was in shock. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that when I got to New York was the first time that I, uh, that I found out that I wasn't white. Mm. <laughs> if that, I understand. <laughs> when I was in Colombia, yeah. I didn't. As a little, as a little kid, you, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that there was uh, so many uh, different cultures, or mm -hmm. uh, or you get placed in so many different boxes and stuff like that. I think Colombia back when I was little, there was only two. Mm -hmm. were, and then when I got to New York, I real I realized, oh, uh, I'm. I, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm, I'm seeing different here. Indeed. But I mean, that's in retrospect, like the, as an adult looking back, I mm -hmm. see that that whole journey from Colombia because it was out of nowhere. Uh, my parents got divorced and uh, my mom, uh, my mom came. Well, she we, we ended up in Texas first, in Houston, Texas first, because that's where her brother, my uncle lived. Okay. And my grandmother, that's where she, her mother, that's, that's where she that's where she was at that time. So uh, when she uh, uh, left my father, she took my, my older brother and my sister and me to, to Houston. And mm -hmm. we ended up there from one day or from one month to the next. We All of a sudden, I was in, well, it was probably longer. It was probably uh, a few months, I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All I know is that it was, uh, it was in the, the winter break. Mm -hmm. I was in school in Colombia. And by the next, by, by January of the next month, I was, all of a sudden, I was in, in some school in, in, in Houston, in, in Katy, Texas. Oh. But we never stayed in Texas because my older brother didn't like the weather in Texas. He thought it was too hot and humid. Oh, wow. And then that's how we ended up in, we were only there for a couple of months, maybe like five months or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and then we ended up in New York and that's where I grew up. The Empire State. Yeah. In Astoria, Queens, New York. I grew up in Astoria, which is a fairly, the part that I grew up is very Italian and Greek. Mm-hmm. But I think, uh, again, that was another thing where it was like, you, I, I saw other cultures that you see the difference, but then you also see that we're so much more alike than we are different. Like, mm. you know, like like a, a lot of those little Italian kids and Greek kids, uh, their mothers and their grandparents didn't speak English like my mother and, and my mm -hmm. older brother. And they would, when my mom would yell out the window for me to come eat, and at the beginning I would be embarrassed that she was yelling to me in Spanish. Mm -hmm. But then th I would hear them, their their grandparents would call them in mm -hmm. Italian, Franco, mangia, venga, mangia. Like it, was, mm -hmm. it was just like, it was funny. It was, it was like the same, the same family dynamics, yeah. just different languages. Yeah. How has that informed your acting? A lot, I think traveling a lot not mm -hmm. only I'm sorry, not only informs uh my acting, but I think it's just uh my personality like uh, when you travel and you meet other people from different cultures, you like what I just said, you start to see that we're a lot more That's alike true. than we are different. I love that that's something I miss about New York is just everybody's together and you really get to see everyone's culture come through. You, you see a little bit of it in L.A., but I feel like it's it's a little different. Yeah, I think over here, everything is so spread out and yeah. because you have to drive everywhere. Like, yeah. it, it, it's it's hard. You have to make a point to do that in New York because everything is so together, I think, like closer yeah. together. And you, you travel freely through the subway. so easy mm -hmm. to travel. Like, it's just thrown on you. It's, it, mm -hmm. You see it everywhere. You see it like, in, I mean, I'm pretty sure you know. I know in, in New York, in Queens, Jackson Heights, right? There's yes. Ru the Roosevelt Avenue, right? Mm -hmm. There's a there's a there's there's like three or four blocks that it's all Colombian restaurants. But then you go further down, and it's like, it's like little India. It's bomb. It's all mm -hmm. Indian c cuisine. And then down the block f further, it's all Mexican. And then mm -hmm. further down is Dominican. So it's like you've got like five different right. countries in the middle of like a, a square radius of a few blocks. That's true. Ah, New York. I low-key miss it. It's fine. It's fine. So you're in New York at this point. When did you catch the acting bug? When did it bite you? Take hold. Uh, that bug bit me in college. Okay. So uh, I in college, I, uh, I was dreading uh, this speech class because uh, we had to make uh, three speeches for our speech class, and I was very shy or scared of speaking in public. Mm-hmm. And so I was scared of having to make three speeches in this class. And then the professor said that um, if we audition for the speech and theater department play, just for auditioning, we would get five extra points on our final grade and 10 extra points if we make it into the play. Wow. So I thought, well, I'm going to need all the help I can get. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go audition for this stupid play then. Mm -hmm. And then I went and I auditioned for the play and the, the director gave me the lead role in the play. And after wow. that, it was all done. Uh, two years later, I changed majors, mm -hmm. changed schools, screwed up all my plans. Everything. Yeah. So you were at John Jay at this time? Yeah, that's where I was at John Jay, starting, uh, studying criminal justice. My plan was to oh, be, wow. uh, I wanted to be a lawyer in the Marines. I wanted to be like Kevin Bacon in A Few Good Men. Yeah. So my plan was I was going to go to college and mm -hmm. get an undergrad degree, go to officer school during the summer. Mm -hmm. By the time I graduated uh, college, I'd also be finishing um officer the finishing office they had that 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 option back then mm -hmm. and then i would go into law school and go be a lawyer for the marines wow so how did your family react to the news that you are going to focus on acting they hated it i 
I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was so disappointed. My sister thought she wasted all that money in St. John's Prep. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I have a lot of friends who are from similar backgrounds, and it, their parents usually don't take it very well. No, no, my mom. But, but it's funny because my mom, uh, well, it's such a, my mom has Alzheimer's now, so I have such mm. a little. Uh, but my mom, uh, when I when I told her that I think I'm going to do this, she she was very disappointed. She was like, "No, Mijo, this, that's a hobby. It's a hobby. How mm. is that?" And I was like, "You should be a lawyer. This should be your hobby. This and that. You're not going to make real money." And she was very disappointed. But mm. I, but then when she started seeing me on TV, then then she was like, "Oh, my son, the artist. I always wanted to be an artist. Mm. I knew you were going to be an artist." I, and I'm like thinking, "Huh." But you don't remember <laughs> you telling me that you thought it was just a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> Man, so at this point, do you feel like you've made it? Do you feel like you've proved all the haters wrong? Uh, do I feel like I've made it? No, no. I feel like, I think, but I think even people who are at the, even the A-listers, I think, always feel like they want more, that they could do more. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I'm any different than that. I think I'm in that boat. I always feel like... I want to do more. I, or when I look at my work, I always nitpick at stuff and say, oh, I could have done better here. I could have done better that. Mm-hmm. I'm always so, do I feel like I've made it? No, no. I, don't think, I don't think I'm comfortable thinking. I am always, I'm always thinking there's more that I should be doing or there's more that I could do. Mm. So you mentioned that you have a project that you've been working on for a few years. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Oh, yeah. It's a, I, I do this thing called Capoeira. You know what Capoeira is? No. So capoeira is this Brazilian martial art. Uh, oh, okay. I've seen it written out, but I've never heard it pronounced. So now I know what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> Every, everyone thinks is 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 dancing. Everyone thinks is dancing yes. because it's with with music. It's like in a circle and it's very acrobatic. There's mm-hmm. like two people in the middle of a circle and they're doing like flips and kicks, round kicks and handstands and all mm-hmm. this. So people think that that it, that it's. Uh, that it's a dance. Mm-hmm. The whole thing started the, the background. Behind, although it's arguable, it, the the history is, is it's not confirmed because the after slavery was abolished in, in in Brazil, they burned all the the documents. But the general idea was that it started in the in the slave quarters in Brazil with mm-hmm. African slaves, and they were they were training to have a revolution against the slave masters to revolt against the slave masters, mm-hmm. and the slave masters realized that they were training or they were organizing, so that separated them, and then so the slaves came up with the idea that in so in st- so that to mask that they were training to have a revolt, they started playing music, so the just so the slave masters could think that they were just dancing and playing around when they were just training and organizing to have a. To revolt against the slave master, so th- so that's the general idea of how of how the art form began. Mm-hmm. And now, I mean, so many years later, it's just it's. I think it's like an underground. It's kind of I I, I I have a feeling that it's kind of like like break dancing in the eighties, mm-hmm. where it's like it's hot in the underground, but in the mainstream, nobody really knows about it. Mm-hmm. I think that's how Capoeira is now. It's like it's worldwide. There's a lot. Is there's thousands, if not millions, of schools worldwide, mm-hmm. but a lot of people don't know about it. Mm-hmm. So. The project that I, I wanted, I wrote a feature script about my experience with Capoeira here in 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 L.A. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I did a, a like a, a Kickstarter kind of campaign mm-hmm. to raise money. And because of that, I teamed up with this really good writer. Her name is Erin Dignam. She's worked on a she's I mean, I can't even mention all the but she's a really good writer. She's an established writer and her daughters do Capoeira as well at the same school where, where, where I trained. Mm hmm. And then uh, when I did this this Kickstarter campaign, she became aware of it, and we had a meeting, and now we're developing it into a into a pilot. That's cool. And the story that she pitched me is a thousand times better than the idea that I had, so I'm just excited about that. And now we got our mestre, who's in Brazil. He's involved in the project, and his sons, who who are known actors in Brazil, mm-hmm. they're involved in the project. So so I'm excited because it's it's you know I've been working on it for a long time, and finally I'm getting. I'm I'm getting into the place where to tell the story that I want to tell because before mm-hmm. when I when it was a, when it was a feature film mm-hmm. I did have some meeting with some production companies but they wanted they didn't they wanted to turn it into something else they wanted to turn That's they fair. wanted to tell a different story that I that that I wanted to tell. Mm-hmm. So how have you managed to keep that keep it to its um, I guess. I guess you could say keep it pure, or like keep it true to the vision that you had. Well, it's been hard again because uh, you, you know I had the opportunity to sell the rights to to my script and, mm-hmm. and make this film that this production company wanted to make, 
and 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 it, it was a good amount of money mm -hmm. <laughs> but i just i just you didn't like it no i didn't like the idea that it had it was it was i mean just not to say anything it was just going to be completely different than the story that i wanted to tell so mm -hmm. so it was disappointing because i yeah i, I it was i had to start again mm -hmm. from square back back to square one and it was disappointed mm -hmm. because i had worked on it for a while um but i think start doing this kickstarter campaign it was a seed and spark which is another version of yes, kickstarter and i and i hooked teamed up with this production avenida productions which they help fundraise do fundraisers for uh for that for kickstarters mm -hmm. for for projects so i teamed up with them and we did this seed and spark campaign which within our, my small community of Capoeira people mm -hmm. got a lot of buzz. And that's how Aaron, the, the writer, mm -hmm. became aware of it. And I think I'm, we're finally heading down the same the avenue that I, that I, or the path that I want to go down. Because mm -hmm. she knows Capoeira, like authentic and Capoeira people, like authentic, the, how, how it really is. Mm -hmm. And so she understands the story that I want to tell. That, that I want to stay away from the stereotypical, the violence and drugs and yeah. gangs and shooting and stuff, but more, it's just a little sliver of life of, of this underground, unrepresented community of people. That, yeah. And it mixed in with this beautiful art form that aesthetically, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's just dope. Yeah. I mean, when you see people do cowboy, like these kids, the way they, they, they do, like, it's not just a backflip anymore. Like, they do, like, a half twist. They're not, it's just it's amazing beautiful. what they do it with is. their body. And then just the whole, um, not just that it's aesthetically beautiful, but, like, the whole behind, like, it was a it was a martial art developed by slaves, whether if it was in Africa or Brazil, it was still developed by, by people that are in the outskirts, people that are... Uh, uh, that are shunned from society and it mm -hmm. was this 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 art from developed not only for self-defense but for expression yeah and it turned into this you know this, this world form. yeah and, and this worldwide art form that people connect to that's really cool so in addition to that do you have any other projects coming up obviously we can watch you on usa but is it, are there any other projects you have coming up we should be aware of uh, there are there's a there's a film that I did last year that I think it's about to start uh, getting distribution and nice. I just don't, I just don't know all the details about it and they okay. changed the name so I can't even say the name oh, because yeah. they just changed the name to uh, oh he's gonna be so mad the director I can't I can't remember the name he changed it um, and there's two things that I'm that are that are in the works but those I can't I can't, can't say about, about either one of them I signed an N I signed an NDA got you and then the other one I I'm free to speak but I feel I'm superstitious I feel like I, I never like saying it you until got it. it's like yeah I understand I, don't, I feel I, like I jinx it I get it it's okay understood you've got a friend in me I understand where you're coming from <laughs> there you go princess from Baltimore Princess she got from my Baltimore. Back. She got my back. I try. I try as much as I possibly can. Because you went to St. John's College. St. John's University. That's how it's because you went yes. to St. John's University. Because I went to St. John's and I'm familiar with Queens. And my sorority sister lived in Astoria. So there we oh, go. Oh, nice. Connection. Full circle, y'all. There you go. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was lovely. I learned so much. Where can our fans find you on social media? Yes. Uh, on Twitter is hash. No, it's. At J Eddie Martinez dot com. So J J E D D I E Martinez dot com. And on Instagram is Eddie Martinez 11. 11. Yes. 1 1. Yes. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. You can find me on Instagram at Princess CTV. I'm also on Twitter at Princess CTV. You guys can also find me on the All Rise After Show and Lock and Key After Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you later. Thanks again, Eddie. Thank you. Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal. 